Good evening, everyone. I'm Karen McCarty, and I'm really delighted to welcome all of you here this evening. I know you all braved through this weather, but I promise you this evening's program will reward you for, for weathering it. So thank you for coming, and um, look forward to having all of you participate. I know there'll be a question and answer uh, session at the very end. Uh, Disenio is a series that highlights the achievements of Latino designers working in the United States. Launched in 2014, we are already in our fifth year of programming. Disenio has been made possible through the sustaining support of the Latino Initiatives Pool and the Smithsonian Latino Center, who we are thrilled to share, will open their first gallery space in 2021, the Molina Family Latino Gallery, dedicated to celebrating the U.S. Latino experience at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. Tonight's program features Henry Munoz, president and CEO of the architecture firm Munoz and & Company, and Alfonso Medina, architect and founder of T38 Studio. They will discuss the ways in which urban development can be a catalyst for economic growth and social political equality. Focusing on cities within the United States-Mexico border, border, Munoz and Medina will explore how communities can grow responsibly while honoring local histories and traditions. Henry Munoz, who will speak first, Henry Munoz, R. Munoz III, is a great friend of Cooper Hewitt and the Smithsonian. In addition to being on Cooper Hewitt's board, he was part of the Smithsonian National Board from 1999 to 2005 and is Chairman Emeritus of the Smithsonian's Latino Center Board. As a designer, social activist, opinion leader, philanthropist, and an architect of change, Munoz works across multiple, multiple platforms that converge at the intersection of politics and the built environment. Under the three decades of his leadership, Munoz and Company has pioneered an approach to architecture and design that acknowledges the rapidly shifting demographics of the United States. Munoz and Company shapes the skyline and the landscape of the U.S.-Mexico borderlands, practicing a community-based architecture in pursuit of a blended cultural expression that more fully reflects our multicultural identity. In 2005, Alfonso Medina established Tajer 38, focused in real estate development and construction, which since its founding has built over 30 different housing projects. And in 2009, he opened T38 Studio, an architecture design and research office based in New York City and Tijuana. He has taught at the Universidad Iberoamericana in Tijuana, Southern California Institute of Architecture and École Supérieure Spéciale d'Architecture in Paris. In 2013, he was awarded the Curbed Young Guns Award, and most recently, he co-founded Metalon Group, based in New York City, a startup focused on democratizing housing, where he currently serves as CEO. Following each pre speaker's presentation, there will be a moderated discussion with Christina de Leon, Cooper Hewitt's Associate Curator of Latino Design. Welcome, and we will start with Henry. Thank you, Kara. Um, for me, the idea of diseño being celebrated at the Smithsonian Institution is a major um, achievement. So I want to applaud this museum, which I have been a part of and which has been an important part of my life in preparing for this uh, conversation. It became immediately, uh, uh, you know, I was struck by how important the Cooper Hewitt and how important the Smithsonian have been to my life and to my career. In fact, the first time I ever walked into this building, I was looking for a slide projector, which will show you how long ago that was. And it was because the Cooper Hewitt had decided to collect the design archives of Latino designers across the country, which was unheard of at the time. I think it's important uh, for you to understand a little bit about 
where I came from. Um, I'm the little boy in the, in the foreground. Uh, in, seated somewhere in the auditorium is the, lieutenant, the former Lieutenant Governor of Texas, Ben Barnes. Not long after this, I went to work for him. This is important because my father was a labor leader along the border between Texas and Mexico, and he believed, he told me, that it didn't matter how small you were, you could make a big contribution. He really believed that um, the movement of a people began with the steps of just one person, and he started that uh, thinking within all of his children from a very young age. Uh, I, th I thought this was important. This is both a, a drawing and a photograph from later in that day. And it was the first time that I remember that people who weren't even born in this country thought about the American dream and believed in the American dream even if they weren't born as Americans. So this is my mother. That is my little head. And this face right here is the face of my brother. But I'll never forget that day with these two men who had been working in the fields carrying the American flag and behind them the banner of the Virgen de Guadalupe. I think this was the beginning of my political instincts and my belief that politics is important in developing communities. This is my family um, about the same time and my mother was an incredible designer and loved fashion and I think if she had been born at a different time she herself would have been a fashion designer and it was really the blending of those two parts of my heritage that inspired me to become a designer and an activist. It <laughs> <laughs> My mom told me, Mijo, I knew you were gay when you walked out of Funny Girl um, <laughs> singing, <laughs> singing people. Um, that's an important part of who I am, too, and it was the beginning of my understanding of th that the country has never been equal, that there are people who are on the outside and people who are on the inside, and it was the connectivity to um, the part of me that is brown connected to the part of me that is LGBT, um, connected to the feminist part of me. When I was very young, <laughs> at the age of 29, I went to work uh, for um, the last woman governor of the state of Texas who believed that the border between the United States and Mexico was the front door to opportunity and not the back door uh, to the United States. And she tasked me, I used to, I now have hair like hers, but that is what my hair <laughs> used to look like. And, um, and she decided that she would change the lives and the condition and the economic development of all of the people along the Texas-Mexico border, and that taught me an incredible amount about um, design. Uh, years later, I went to work for the man that I called the first mestizo president mm -hmm. of the United States because he's not just African American, he's of mixed heritage. And it is that connectivity, I think, to people who have, um, who are empowered by the political system of the United States that really has informed my work over the course of the last 30 years. I started searching after that experience of working with Ann Richards for an architecture that was unique to my community, unique to the border of the United States and Mexico, and I found it in the houses of poor people. I didn't find it in universities, I didn't find it in school districts, I found it in places like this. And the artist community of the United States, the artist community of Texas were the people who took me by the hand and, and taught me about the kind of scholarly aspects of, of identity, of cultural identity, and what they were beginning to do. This is a very famous piece that was first shown to me by a curator by the name of Amalia Malagamba uh, called Border Door. And all of that really is important because no, no one person, <laughs> no one president of the United States either, has the ability to stop what is happening in this country. Within a very short period of time, this country will be majority minority and the Latino community of the United States will be leading that conversation. And it is a myth to think about us as immigrants to this country, not only because we've been shaping this country for centuries, but because most of the Latinos who live in the United States were born in the United States. So look at the future of every major American city. <laughs>
increasingly Latino, increasingly minority, speaking English, speaking Span Spanish, speaking Spanglish, and yet none of the schools that I have come into contact, none of the urban planning efforts of these great cities of the 21st century are taking into account this massive shift that is occurring in the country. In fact, over the course of 30 years, we began to think about design principles for cities across the United States that deal with this new American reality. Um, Latin America and Latinos were some of the first urban designers in civilization. This is a project on the south side of San Antonio that I did in partnership with Ramiro Salazar, who is sitting in the front row this evening that brought a public library to a place in San Antonio that was historically rich but institutionally poor. You can see in the background of this library the 300 plus year old missions of San Antonio. And you also have an opportunity to see the cultural landscape that surrounds those missions that in the 20th century are incredibly rich with um, restaurants and retail of people who uh, have, uh, who respect the informal beauty of San Antonio that may not be the kind of formalized architecture that we think about, but that are incredibly rich and future looking. And this is that library, which is a piece of modernist architecture inspired by the silhouettes and the materials of the mission. And here are examples of that palette of materials. And it is um, influenced by a series of outdoor spaces that have provided wonderful places for the community to gather. And it was for many years the home of the last great drive-in movie theater in San Antonio, Texas. And that's the marquee of the Mission Drive-In. And this uh, project, really due to the great design talents of my staff at Munoz and Company, won both a national award from the American Institute of Architects and an American Library Association Award. But most importantly, it brought resources to people who needed them, computers and access to books that didn't have them before. And it led us to begin working very closely with the National Parks uh, Service on a survey of Latino um, historic sites or the lack of Latino-influenced historic sites in the country. Less than 2% of the National Historic Parks, National Historic Monuments and sites in this country tell the story of women gay people or minorities. And this uh, survey of the Latino influence on the country's history, which is very different than the mythology of the founding of the United States, recognized that 400 years ago, uh, the United States was founded at the intersection between the Spanish and the indigenous people. And that then became this great movement of the National Park Service to uh, declare the San Antonio Missions, a World Heritage Site. All of it connected to each other. And when you don't have libraries and you don't, aren't in the archives and you don't see yourself in school, telling stories of who you are is incredibly important. This is a project that our office did in collaboration with the Cooper Hewitt, a performing arts center where no performing arts centers existed along a stretch of the Texas-Mexico border that in the relationship with the Smithsonian Institution was focused on a corrido. A corrido is a border folk song that tells the story of people, one aspect of people. This uh, project uh, took shape after a student in a focus group, not much larger than this, raised his hand after we asked the question, what makes Ed Couch Elsa different from any place else? And he said, well, we play a a football, Cody, though, every Friday before we go out and, uh, and get on the field. And I said, what's that? And he said, well, it's a piece of music. And so the design of the mural on the outside 
of the building really mimics the notes of the football corrida, which, are called, which is called La Maquina Amaria, um, every Friday. And so the building looks like this. <laughs> and that's the first drawing of this building, which was featured in a major exhibition here at the Cooper Hewitt. And it was the first time that anything like that happened. And what was beautiful about that building is that that folkloric dance program of the high school students became really incredibly vibrant. And now more students go to Ivy League schools from Ed Couch Elsa Independent School District than from any other school district along the Texas-Mexico border. And uh, I found in South Texas that we weren't really building institutions that were welcoming or that told the story of who we are that looked like the students that we were hoping to inspire. In fact, they were intimidating. So this is just uh, one campus called, that is today known as the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. Um, there was a planetarium, which was the only planetarium along a hundred mile stretch of the Texas Mexico border, and it was scheduled to be demolished, and instead we saved it and created a science courtyard surrounded by a 21st century um, science complex. That's the old planetarium, which has now been restored, and hundreds of middle school students come to that planetarium and stand in the courtyard and understand that if they stay in school, they can become scientists and astronomers, which is the her their heritage through the Mayans and the Aztecs. And this is the recently completed second phase of that project. You can kind of see this mural of the constellations that you now enter through um, to get to the courtyard. And this is the education building, which is sitting right next to it, which is, um, educates more bilingual teachers than any other place in the United States. And so we curated um, words and sayings, dichos, using, um, utilizing the talents of those teachers. And you can see here that both in English and in Spanish, you're on a journey to education. So. Um, it is, I like to say it's the first bilingual building in the United States. I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> because I think that there is a mythology of the way that we were founded as a country, which is not the reality. We are a blended culture. And uh, it is important to remember that, in particular, at this moment in our country's history. So this is a building. Um, that was a temporary building at Art Basel in Miami, built out of 17,000 uh, Mexican soda bottles. <laughs> um, that was really just intended to talk about the beauty of everyday life um, in the place that I live. And at the end of the exhibition, people took the soda bottles <laughs> home. But it was uh, an amazing opportunity to take a piece of the culture of the border, bring it to an international art fair, and bring attention um, to the beauty of the way that we live in South Texas. And that those explorations became design in other ways. So we designed a program called Latino Victory, not just the logo, but the idea that we should begin looking at the next generation of Latino elected leadership so that they would be in positions of power to influence these decisions. I'm happy to say that um, this organization that I started with Eva Longoria has elected the first Latina to the United States Senate, just elected a Latina governor of New Mexico, just elected the first two Latinas ever to serve in Congress from the state of Texas and about 20 more congressmen since then. And I think particularly at moments like this, having pride is incredibly important when people tell you that you are not important and that your voice doesn't matter. And so um, I, together with Don Graham in Washington, D.C., I started a scholarship program that today has almost 4,000 scholars for young people who are undocumented in this country and can't get any other form of financial aid, and that, that is a huge design opportunity. And today, I am working with people in this room on a program called SOMOS, which is a program that um, is bringing, first of all, did an assessment of health care or the lack of health care for Latinos in the city of New York and is bringing solutions to that problem. 
And I want to end by talking about um, cities and Latino urbanism. This is a, this is a, is it? okay. This is a ditch that w in the past was the most important thoroughway in San Antonio. San Antonio is known for its river walk, but back in the 300 years ago, the most important outdoor living room was San Pedro Creek, which is connected to the second oldest public park in the United States. And because of flooding, it became this, a ditch. And in the last uh, 10 years, we've been working on the environmental redevelopment of it, turned it into a cultural park, have populated it with these incredible murals that tell the story of Texas and the United States. It has an affinity with other great places like this around the country. This is the Great Wall of Los Angeles, but also Park Well in Spain and this mural project in Brazil. It is a place that is on a Saturday and a Sunday now filled with people. That is, this right here is a rendering of the sky over San Antonio 300 years ago during the founding of the city. And we've taken this work and connected the linear park to the kinds of opportunities that people need to have in order to excel in their daily lives. Public transportation, access to public education, access to higher education, all within a few blocks of this linear park. Um, it's funny for me to be standing in a building of the Smithsonian Institution, knowing that um, one day soon there will be a Smithsonian American Latino Museum. The gallery of the Molina family is the first step toward that. I was lucky enough to serve as the chairman of the commission to establish the Smithsonian American Latino Museum, and I believe that sometime over the course of the next few years, that museum will be created um, so that people like myself and my husband and the fourth Henry and my family will have an opportunity to understand that their stories are important to the American story, that equality really is the guiding principle of our country, and that together we have an opportunity, no matter what is going on in this country today, to make sure that every American feels like their contributions to this country are respected. Well, first, thank you so much for the um, invitation. It's an honor to be here at the, the Cooper Hewitt sharing uh, a bit about our, our work on the border, the San Diego and Tijuana border. I was actually also born in Texas. Uh, from uh, My parents moved from Mexico City to Texas, was born there. Uh, then they moved to San Diego and, and eventually to, to Tijuana where I, I grew up. Um, and growing up in, in Tijuana, you're like in a different world, uh, I'd say. Um, it's not about Tijuana and San Diego. It's not about Baja California and California or, or Mexico and the States. It's one single region that's really dependent on, on each other. And me growing up, for example, we'd go to the movies in San Diego. Or when I was 16, I started cycling. And I was competing sometimes in the Mexican National Championships. And the month after, I'd be competing in, in the US National Championships. And, and we would train in in San Diego every day. So I'd go to school in, in Tijuana, would leave school, and, and my best friend and, and I would cross the border every day, go to Subway every day, I guess it was before keto and gluten, and, uh, and then go ride our bikes for, for three hours and, and come back to, to Tijuana. So there was never really an understanding that this is a, a solid, solid border, which I still believe it is, and it's a very porous, porous border. Um, 
this is an image that I, I really love because it, it really reflects our, our practice. Um, our practice is really based on, on building. Um, it's not about building houses, it's about building communities. And, and the way that we're able to really achieve this is through this, this amazing people that, that are actually the craftsmen that do our, our, our built environment. And the reality is that, I mean, I'm very naive, which could be something very positive or something very negative, but um, I started my practice when I was 21. I had the opportunity to, to start a, a building a house, literally. And from there, really have seen it always as, as housing as a, a tool. Um, most of you have probably seen this, this image, and this is what that border region is like. And one of the crazy parts is what, when you're flying to Tijuana, um, when you're about to land, you see the border really clearly. And you don't see it because there's a wall, but you see it because it's green on one side and it's brown on the other, um, literally which is kind of crazy, same region, same ecosystem, but one side has literally built up to the wall, the other one tries to, to stay away from it. Um, this is literally the border crossing that 12 million people go through um, a year, just walking, another like 50 driving. Um, and that is how, how protected it's been for a really long time, so I guess since September 2001. Um, but anyways, we still want to build more walls, I guess, because this is really not enough. Um, and what's crazy is that people are doing, I don't know, an hour or two hours standing in the sun trying to cross, and the first thing when you cross is, is a shopping center. So I guess it's the, the American dream. Um, so most of our project, most of our work, what we have, we have developed has been in, in Tijuana up until right now. And um, I love this phrase by, by Machiavelli. And I, I really um, always question the idea of nationalism and, and dealing with urban problems and urban scale solutions at a national level, which I think is, is insane. Uh, regions are so different from each other, societies are so different. That for me, the only scale that you can really work on, I mean, obviously first is, is the single person and, and, and how he lives in his own built environment. From there you go to, to your housemates or your family or whatever, then the neighborhood and then the city. But I guess that's where it stops. You can't really have plans at a, a national, much less an international level. Tijuana is uh, the fourth largest city in, in Mexico in a quickly, quickly growing city. Um, obviously, because of its proximity to, to San Diego and California, one of the biggest economies in, in the world. Um, but it started kind of like Tijuana was Vegas before Vegas existed. Uh, when Prohibition happened, people would go down to, to Tijuana to, to drink. So we actually had some amazing architects from LA do the the horse racetrack, uh, do some mansions in Tijuana, and, and from there the, the city kind of evolved. So it was always kind of a, this very informal, weird, weird thing. But it's a city that, that expanded without any plans in a very, very organic way. It was growing about three hectares a day at one point. Um, and by 2010, it had like grown to be one of the biggest cities, and it's still one of the cities with, with the biggest projected growth in, in Mexico. And this is the, the landscape of, of Tijuana. About 50% of the city um, has been developed in a very informal way um, by its own citizens, which I think is an amazing way to, to develop a city. If only we could do that here. Um, most of it has been self-built, but the thing is that through building like this is, is the way that you actually do create community. Um, for, for communities to exist, people need to take ownership and, and pride of, of, where, of where they live. Um, so if you saw this landscape 20 years before this picture was taken, most of that housing was actually cardboard housing. Um, but through time and through a lot of people actually working in San Diego and, and living in Tijuana, so they have like good economies, they're actually able to to develop their own houses and they end up being like mansions, basically. Um, but there's also the aspect of, of Ray City that recycles. Um, 
So you can see a lot, like a lot of houses that are made up of old recycled components that come from demolished housing from California. A lot of garage door walls, recycled windows. But in the end, there's, there's beauty to that. And, and it's something that has always interested us a lot. Um, doing this, this research into there's so many things going on right now in, in the states related to, to affordability in housing and how big of a problem that is. Um, but how come in Mexico, really, sometimes when building like this, it has never been a, a problem. People are actually able to customize their homes to whatever needs they have at the moment, uh, multi-nuclear um, housing. Um, and it's actually housing that works in a sense. It's a, a collage city, and, and for me, the, there's a real beauty in that, in, in, in this informality of a city and, and, and this, an aesthetic richness to that. And then you have like the really formal part of it in, in a city that grown, grows in an informal way. Then you have this huge, super greedy developers that say, we're going to do it this uh, the proper way. So they do new cities. Um, I, my master's is in urbanism, and, and it's one of the words that I hate the most, master planning urbanism. You can't really master plan a, a city. Um, cities need to grow organically. So what happens when you actually master plan a city that in which people living here will take, I don't know, two hours to get to work? This is the result. I mean, I wish it was a Donald Judd in Martha, but that's mm -hmm. housing in, in Tijuana. So whatever has had a start as a really, in a really informal way, turned out to be very informal communities, very formal housing, and whatever started in a very formal way ended up being super, super informal. So a lot of our work has been trying to really understand that, that process of how, how city making and, and place making happens. Um, this was our, our first office, uh, very formal, I guess. Um, <laughs> We started literally, there's a piece of land. Um, somebody wants to buy a house, you want to do it? Sure, why not? Um, hired some construction workers and literally spent a year building two, two houses. And just learning, basically. Um, was very lucky to, to assemble a, an amazing team at first. This picture was 15 years ago. Uh, but these guys are still there. Uh, Flaco is there. Hugo, he's like the master in concrete detailing, model, uh, tile worker. Um, they're still part of the team. Jaime is now in charge of actually larger multifamily projects that we're, that we're developing. So it is kind of a, a family that keeps, keeps growing. And it's kind of like a loop. Always um, we're feeding them information and they're feeding us information. Everything is informed by, by that process. And I guess um, we really wouldn't have been able to, to do the work that we've done without this, this process. Everything is literally a, a work in progress. And what I'm showing you about Tijuana, for us, it's, it's one single project. Oh, well, anyways. So about three or four years after I, I started, I obviously, as any architect, wanted to do something bigger. So we found a, a site in, in a different neighborhood than the one we had been working on where we have like this single family mansions. Tijuana is a city that looks over to San Diego and says this is the most amazing city in the world. Um, California style McMansions are beautiful. Um, let's, let's replicate them in, in Tijuana. So most of what you see is this huge, huge structures. And for us, um, it's completely unsustainable to think that you can have that scale of, of housing and, and in a city that's growing so much, but instead of growing vertically or more densely, it's just spreading out. So we bought this site, which was sown for a single family, and really pushed to get permits to do four units instead of one, up to the point where, where everything was going very slow. So we said, like, fuck it, it's better to ask for forgiveness than for permission. So we started building and eventually the, the permits came. Um, but I, I mean, it's the only way that we know of like to really push an, an, an idea, to really believe in, in what, you're, what you're doing. 
and you can see in, in scale within the context, four families living here take up way less space than most single families around there. And I mean, this is why you really learn. These guys are way more creative than any, any designer or architect. Um, Well, there wasn't a ladder available, I guess. Let could get them up there in a safe way. <laughs> then from there, we jumped to this project in which we're doing 15 single-family houses in one, in one single neighborhood. Um, those were all part of that, that project. Um, this one, we invited uh, an amazing architect from LA, Peter Sellner, to design it. And we developed and built all of them. Um, we had to convince the owner of the land that his idea of doing 10,000 square foot lots that were $500,000 each was not really going to, to work. So he told us, well, go build your houses and if you can actually build and, and sell, we'll do the streets after. Um, so we were so confident that we actually started developing before there were like any streets or anything. Um, we sold the house and the client was super nervous, like, please tell me there's gonna be streets before I move in. <laughs> Obviously, in Tijuana, you can never be so sure of something like that. Um, and in the end, every, every house was different. Every house was an, an aesthetic experiment. Uh, and for us, it's just we have an interest in, in doing things and just using very traditional construction methods, very affordable materials, um, just trying to find a, a different language and trying to do things in, in, in different ways. Um, and it's interesting because since it's a small team, um, I, I sell, I, I build these houses, I know the clients personally, you start establishing all of this relationship with the people that eventually inhabit them. So, so it's very interesting to really understand how you thought of something, uh, you thought, oh, this will work great, and then your client's like, ah, this is terrible. Um, but then now he, this guy, the client, moved to, back to Mexico City and we're finishing his house now there because he missed his house in, in Tijuana so, so much. All of them are within this very kind of suburban context in, in Tijuana. So after this, our interests really shifted into, okay, so I guess we've done a couple of single family houses. We should do more multifamily projects. So we, this is the house that, that Peter from LA designed. A couple more single family houses. I'm gonna jump quickly. So we started as an architect, wanted to do larger buildings that could be published in magazines. So <laughs> we, um, we started working with different developers and, and since we knew the, the development in, uh, business, it was very interesting because it was a, a conversation, and a collaboration in very different ways. So we focused on one single neighborhood um, and did a couple of projects there. This is a 16 unit um, condo building. While that was getting finished here, um, we got invited to do a competition for a multifamily building here, even larger scale, um, 300,000 square feet of, of construction. So it was super, super excited. Um, we proposed keeping half of the site as a garden Obviously, we thought that was going to be crazy and we were going to lose, but it was still worth it, and, and we won. And a couple of years after, it was, it was built. And for us, it was an amazing experience just to, to get to understand how to, like business-wise, uh, city-wise, uh, construction-wise, how you can actually put up a, a project of this, this scale. It was an, an amazing learning experience. And, and for us, just having a, a garden of this scale was the best result we could ask for. An amazing view of the, the city. So you can see in context how much the projects relate to, to each other. And then on to, to our on, ongoing projects, as I said, I mean, this is our, our conversation every day. Um, half of, no, I'd say most of the time that I'm on my phone and on WhatsApp, I'm replying to message, messages from construction workers and not so much to from, from architects. So for us, it's just about finding different, different scales of, of collaborating with these guys and, and talking about like, 
Okay, so we found this, uh, I don't know if you've heard of, and so Mari, the Auto Projetacione project, but we're very interested in, in democratization and democratization of high-end design, not only in, in housing, but in furniture and in any scale. So there's an ongoing conversation with, for example, the construction workers of what they think that a chair is or, or that it should be and them designing the, the furniture that they're actually using to have lunch during their, their breaks um, at construction sites. <laughs> and just different iterations and collaborations. Um, it's kind of like a dialogue. This, is, uh, this was actually done by the director of the, the office here. And it was done at the same time that they were doing this. So it's this ongoing dialogue that we always have between Tijuana and, and New York. This is uh, a project we're working on right now. Um, just to show how it fits within, within the the context, we went a little bit crazy here. The construction workers really didn't like that, but they were able to, to pull it off. Um, we're very, very excited because in the end for us, it's about Tijuana's right now going through this super crazy rapid um, densification and there's towers popping all, all over the city. But for us, it's about showing that there's different ways of doing denser developments. Not everything needs to be a, a tower, it could be horizontal. Another project we're doing, this is the house that um, the same owner from the other White House that we're finishing now in, in Mexico City for him. Um, a project we're doing in, in Mexico City in which we're restoring a 100 year old house, putting some additional apartments to it. The house is amazing, the state of it. Lofts we're doing in Mexico City too. And going back to, to housing as a tool. When we first opened our office here in, in New York City, one of the first projects we did was this competition in, in Boston, um, a housing competition, ideas competition. And my partner and I were like, eh, let's do something crazy. What have we learned from, from Tijuana? And let's do like Tijuana in Boston. And we actually won, uh, which was very insane. But, but the basic idea was that you have a, a concrete structure, but then most of the modules, people would be able to acquire kind of like square footages, and then through self-building, they would be able to do their own dwelling space, which would be flexible enough to change through time um, and really do mixed use in a, in a vertical village kind of, kind of way. So, so this project were really about adaptability. Um, two years ago, we started working in Denver, in Denver in this co-living project. Um, same time, we're working a bit in, in one in Mexico City, so we thought like now's the time to really think about um, architecture not as an aesthetic thing, but what can, what can we actually achieve through, through our buildings. Um, for us, it's super important to, uh, and, and the focus is always quality of life. That's what we want to offer anyone that's living in anything that we, we have designed. So I guess that most developers have always this in mind, but for us, if you can't do this, um, it's really impossible to offer <coughs> dignified housing, which is what our new kind of like evolution is going to. Um, I'm so convicted of that, that for the last year, this was my house. Uh, I literally was a nomad just to test out every different possibility of how people live nowadays. Uh, so I lived in any co-living, Airbnb, couch, whatever. Um, and it was a great, great experience to really see um, the basic needs of, of people nowadays in a city like, like New York, to really, really understand. So we took that Boston project, we pushed really hard, and, and we made it a reality. So it is, it's kind of crazy, but um, six years after, we actually built that, how, that Boston project in, in Tijuana. So it's the same idea, a, a concrete structure in which all the walls are, are flexible, and most spaces are about community. It's not about really private space, it's about community. So this is two or three blocks from the other buildings that we've done in which you could rent an apartment for $2,500, which is kind of crazy for Tijuana, but that's a market, I guess. But two blocks away, we did a building in which you could rent a room for $300. So for us, that is what a neighborhood really implies, that democratization of housing within one single, one single neighborhood. 
you can see how close it is to the other one. There's the other one back here. Um, so the basic idea is that it's co-living. You have your, your bedroom with your own bathroom and you share a, a kitchen living room with some communal areas throughout the, the building. This was actually the second building in the world that's been built ground up specifically for, for co-living. So for us, it was more of a lab uh, and a place to, to test ideas, which we knew was impossible to really test here in, in New York. Um, but I think one of the best things is that really it kind of fits within the city in the same way that self-built architecture has, has fit there. And, and for us, that's super important. It's not about doing something that stand out, stands out because it's super contemporary. It's about something that actually blends into its existing context. So I'm gonna go really quickly through um, Madelon, that's the new startup we launched, which is, is focused on literally just um, that de democratization of, of housing. And for us, it, it's going back to this, to really understanding what life is and how people live nowadays and what we want our, our spaces to, to offer its inhabitants. Um, the world is changing very quickly. I mean, eight years ago, there was no Uber, no Airbnb. We lived in a very different way. Um, and by 2030, population will be 8.6 billion. And going from a 50% urban population to a 75% urban population. In a world in which cities are already unaffordable for most young people. And if you see how rent has increased compared with income, that will only keep getting worse. So how can we solve that? A lot of companies, a lot of startups are innovating on the software side of it. We believe that you really need to, to create new hardware in order for that to, to happen. So we're very focused on how, through technology, we can change how a building is developed, how it's designed, how it's built, and how it's operated. Um, we just moved into, very recently, to our new office at the Full Stack Factory in, in the Brooklyn Navy Yards. And the idea is that we're testing out um, how to actually build prefab in a way that you can make it more affordable than traditional construction. Because it's crazy, but the construction industry hasn't really evolved in 50 years. So we're doing different products. One of them is, is co-living, uh, which is really not new since 88% of millennials in New York already live with roommates. It's just about doing it in a, in a bit more formal way. And this is our, what I would say our innovation is. Um, one single prefab module that we can just replicate all over the, the world. But in the end, um, this is what a $1,400 room would look like. And so for us, that is dignified housing. And that is what most people, it's, it's about affordability um, and quality of life. And then we have um, Coti, which is a, another product that's also about housing as a service, but focused a little bit more on the, on the higher end aspect of it. And just to close off, that's basically Tijuana in the context that we're, we're working in. And, um, and for us, bringing that knowledge and that way of doing things in a Mexican and a little bit naive way into, into New York and the work that we're, we're doing here, this is the only way that we can really think very differently um, on the development approach to, to housing. We've talked to a lot of developers and, and everything is just a copy paste. It's a financial model that has been completely solved, um, but they're never thinking about the, the end user. So really going back and, and rethinking the whole model in order to create affordability. So that's it. so much, Henry and Alfonso, for those um, really incredible and insightful presentations. I, I want to leave some time for the audience to ask some questions, but I did want to ask you both a question sort of to follow up and maybe press a little bit more some of the ideas that you brought up in your presentation. Henry, I love if you could speak a little bit to this idea that you brought up um, many times around um, Latino design and um, Latino urbanism. Can you push that a little bit further? Is that something that you think is um, very specific to Southern Texas, to Texas? 
Is that something that can be applied to other areas throughout the United States? I think it can be applied to any city that has a significant Latino population. And that's pretty, pretty much any city in the United States. So the interesting thing about that, the difficult thing about that is that, you know, I'm from a place that is predominantly Mexican and Mexican American, right? And we talk about this population of people in the United States as Latino, and we're very diverse. The, the way that we relate to our communities, our folkloric traditions, are incredibly diverse. The thing that has a tendency to organize us is language. And so I think it's important to retain what makes you unique and special, but then to build upon it. Um, I believe that we're only now as a country beginning to think about the massive change that is happening in cities all over this country. And it's important as you contemplate that massive change to think about the ways in which the uh, Latino community can be um, relates to its neighborhood, right? Relates to the, to, the, to the informal and the formal culture, that you give people an opportunity to design and inform that culture, inform the institutions that are important to that community um, across the board, not only through architecture, but through the design of institutions, public transportation, education, et cetera. So um, I think, Maybe that we have never um, thought about ourselves, elevated and honored our contributions in a way in which uh, we have sought out the respect uh, of, of the institutions in our community. Maybe what I'm really talking about is massive institutional change at this point. So um, it's only a beginning. This is the beginning. I find it really interesting to think about um, the U.S.-Mexican border region and the way those cities are developing in relation to other cities around the U.S. and and how not only does the landscape differ, but even just the way the built environment just drastically differs from a place like San Antonio to New York City. And so much of what you showed um, in your presentation was so rooted in place, was so rooted in a Southwest uh, history and identity. And so when I, when I think about this in a New York City context, in a Washington Heights context, in a East Harlem context, it's so starkly different. There are a lot of similarities and I think um, the idea around community, around place, around a shared culture is there, but I wonder if, if you've thought about those differences and, and the way place and landscape really helps form um, Latinos as, as they grow and as they migrate throughout the US. Um, well, I'm just beginning to think about that because I'm working primarily in New York City at the moment with very similar conditions. I mean, the lack of education, the lack of money, the, the, the need to develop um, community assets is the same. The, the conditions obviously are incredibly different in New York City than they are in San Antonio, Texas. The, the communities are different in that they have different folkloric traditions. So what is unique, what is common, I think, to these two places, let's just consider the border of the United States of Mexico and Texas and New York City, is that it's important for people to tell you how they view themselves. I mean, Alfonso showed beautiful images of the organic nature of people who have been designing for themselves. The beginning of my career was really focused on, uh, on talking to people who never went to architecture school, right? But who had been responsible for forming their community. What I have found in any of the, any of the places that I work, because even in my home state, San Antonio is different than Brownsville, is different from Laredo, is that it's important for people to tell you how they see themselves and what they need, right? How they want to build their future. And when you allow people to do that, when you give them a sense of ownership, even of their schools, their institutions, 
those institutions become more successful, right? Because they can see themselves in it. So here in New York, what I'm working on right now is not the design of a building first, but the design of a reform of a healthcare system for the city of New York. Considering that the majority of the population of New York City lives in a desert when it comes to health care, that these are people who are intimidated by hospitals. And how do you then transform that system to relate to the community that needs it? So um, I don't know the answer. You know, years ago, my mentor, who was the director of culture and creativity at the Rockefeller Foundation, said, you just need to put your head down. And on every single project that you do, find one thing that you really want to explore. And when you pick your head up in 20 years, you're going to begin to understand. You will then begin to understand what that means. And so I'm just beginning to understand what is happening in the city of New York. But what I absolutely know is the case is that the country needs about a thousand more Alfonso's and Henry Munoz's and young people to begin exploring the changes that will occur in the cities in the United States. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Alfonso, I wondered if you can talk a little bit more about Tijuana and the way you've been working on these various developments. You know, it's. I'm interested in knowing sort of the economic divisions within some of these neighborhoods that you are building in. Um, do you see this clear divide? Do you find that it's much more mixed where you have working class with middle class with high, you know, with obviously maybe not the top wealthy, wealthiest class, but this community that you speak about, is it, you know, I was just curious to, to know when you're showing all these images, how mixed is it? I, this is something that in New York we struggle with a lot. Um, not creating silos, not creating, you know, gentrification. It's a huge topic within a lot of communities now, um, not just in New York cities, but in cities across the nation. So I wonder if you could talk a bit about what's happening in, in Tijuana. So it's interesting because uh, our practice has really been informed by by experience. It's literally learning through through doing. And I grew up in a city that doesn't have a very Mexican identity to it. Um, it's a whole other region, and it's not just Tijuana. It's Tijuana San Diego as one single one single culture. And so I never really thought about like. I was born in, in Texas, I, I grew up in Tijuana, I actually had a, a fake Mexican birth certificate because you couldn't have dual citizenship a while ago. Got fixed a while after, but, um, but there was this, this identity in which most of the people I was growing up with were in the same situation. Um, so it creates a, a, an independent uh, identity that's very unique to, to the region. And growing up, my dad was, was an architect, um, he would build single family houses and, and when he did, um, he built a house in this new neighborhood and, and he, I guess, didn't have money to finish it completely. So he built a house, we moved in, but there weren't any, any walls on the garden. And this was in a new development that was literally, as you see in most images in, in development in, in Latin America, this wall with the poorest neighborhood right, right behind it. But we moved in and there was no walls in the garden. So every day, all the people that would go from this neighborhood, go through the back, through the wall, and go to work, they would come down through the, the garden. Literally, we were having breakfast with a, a glass window and everybody was walking by. Um, and Tijuana was that safe at, at that moment. Um, at one point, he, my dad had bought this vintage Mini Cooper, one of those really small ones, and you'd see kids carrying it. They were like literally <laughs> taking the car away back to their, their neighborhood. So for me, it was a very or organic thing. It, it wasn't about this fancy upper class, middle class, whatever neighborhood. Um, and, and the understanding is that neighborhoods really need to be mixed in order to, to, be, to be alive. And, and things happen organically. It's like the only way that a neighborhood actually actually works. Um, but that's the problem with, with planning departments because 
planners here in the States are always kind of have the interest of the developers because you want land value to increase and taxes to increase. So if you don't really try to hack that system, you won't be able to change anything. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the resourcefulness of of building practices in Mexico, and and I think that's something that you see a lot throughout Latin America and, and other areas of the world where um, you are using what you have. And um, in in the Southwest, there's a, a term that's often used called rascuachismo, <laughs> and is and it's that it's it's using what you have, being resourceful, and just doing it. Um, and so I wonder if you could speak a bit about how you've used those sorts of um, uh, building principles and in some of these projects that you've done in the States where it is very linear, you know, there's a very specific way of doing things. Um, what, have, what has been some of, I think, the challenges or, or maybe the ways that you have tried to push the boundaries a bit? It's been a challenge, uh, for sure, being used to working in Mexico and, and now working here. Um, our our way ways of doing things are really different. But again, that I guess that naiveness has you been... You can't ask for um, pardon after you've started the fact. Not, not in the same way, well, I, I would think. That's what Uber and Airbnb have done. I mean, if you really want to change things... Um, there's really no other no other way, and that's why, for example, we want to do housing that's affordable for young people, um, and we could have gone into existing buildings and tried to adapt them or whatever. But the only way is to completely rethink the the system. So we have partners who are developers specialized in in New York, and it's been a very interesting conversation because they have. There are certain like standards of doing things, their financials, their their setups, and we're like, no, 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 we're doing it this way, and uh, it's been a very interesting dialogue, and and I, I think we have, have we've advanced a lot. Uh, we've been very lucky to have partners, uh, for example, in in a project we're doing in in the middle of nowhere in Colorado, um, who are actually willing to to take risks and and think uh, differently, so. I don't know, it's, it's always a learning curve, I guess. Uh, but we learn from our construction workers, they work, learn from us. Uh, we learn from our partners here, they learn from us. And it's like a, a loop and a cycle. And for, I mean, in looking at some of these um, co-habit, uh, habitating projects that you're doing, I mean, young people who have jobs, who are doing pretty well for themselves, I mean, have you thought about how some of these principles can be applied for um, affordable housing for you know families that are much lower income, and and sort of how some of these design principles can be used for to tackle some of the big problems around homelessness? California being one of the ha having one of the highest rates of homelessness. Of course, definitely. In in the end, uh, you want to have an impact in the largest number of people that, that you can. And, and obviously, the most affordable uh, housing is, the, the more problematic it gets uh, socially and in, and in every aspect. So for us, this is kind of like a, a detonator to, to start. But, but in the end, we want to create, obviously, um, we see them as, as housing products, because that's what they are. And, and it's a service. There's an evolution to that. Uh, but for sure, we're really thinking about what a family wow. building would, would imply. Uh, and in, in the end, this is about sharing resources. Uh, we can't have a sustainable future without really sharing way much more resources than we are right now. Um, it's insane in a building in New York City or Brooklyn, there's, I don't know, five nannies in each floor on a Friday wow. night. Uh, why can't you yeah. share those those resources? So it's about really rethinking the way people live. Um, obviously, there will there will always be an exchange of, of the size of the the dwelling uh, it needs to go smaller in order for financials to make sense. Because in the end, you're going to need to finance them through through banks or whatever. But you really need to rethink the the whole system in order to have a, a greater impact on 
that, yeah, homeless, uh, younger families, and really affordable housing. We're not so much thinking about affordable housing. We're thinking much more about housing that's affordable. So I think we're out of time, and we're going to open it up to the audience. Um, thank you so much for that dialogue. Um, my question is for Alfonso. I was so touched by your images, including the photos of the construction workers and talking about how you've learned so much from them. And I'm curious as to, in terms of when you think about the democratization of the design process, how much are they involved perhaps in the profit sharing of these projects? So a couple of them that were in, in the picture have like participations on, on the projects themselves. Because they're, they're not employees as we see them, they're partners. Um, and they've been partners for 15 years. Hi, I just wanted to ask you, um, could you tell us more about the Fulton project that you're doing in the Brooklyn Navy Yards working over there? Uh, so we're, our office is in the full stack factory in the Brooklyn Navy Yards. Um, and we're working in collaboration with them to create all of the buildings that we're doing prefab within that, that factory. Thank you. So the prefab units that you're working on are going to be in that building? No, 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 no. So any site that we do in, in Brooklyn or Harlem, um, the units would be prefabricated there. They're completely finished, uh, furniture, everything's put in place in the factory. Then a crane moves them. You could actually move them by water because the factory is literally on the water. Um, and then you just stack them up on the site. So right now it's not a construction method that's actually more affordable, but it takes away a lot of the unknowns uh, regarding cost, time, um, and all the problems that can arise building in New York where it snows or rains um, a lot of the months. So, we're, for us, this is right now about scalability. Um, if we want to have that impact and, and solve homeless housing, the only way to do it is to, is to really produce it as a product and, and serially produce housing. Um, so for us right now, this is one step. Our next step would be to actually set up a factory in Tijuana where we could ship modules to all of California. Thank you, Henry and Alfonso. So my father was an architect in Cuba and a designer in Cuba and then in Miami. And so we talk about Latino design, but we know that there are many Latino groups. So how do you, how do you view that? How do you see that? How do you integrate you know, Cuban design versus uh, Mexican and, and even Mexican, uh, you know, South uh, Texan versus Californian, et cetera? By letting people design for themselves. You know, every single project I've ever done from, I, I had a, my, I think I, when I started, I thought it was gonna be one thing. I was gonna create this mestizo regionalism. And then I found out within a year of beginning the exploration that every single community viewed themselves differently. There were things in common, right? But they were, like I said before, Laredo was not the same as San Antonio, was not the same as Houston, was not the same as Dallas. And so we developed a process to allow people to design for themselves. The Cooper Hewitt was a part of that conversation, right? We learned that everybody is a designer if they're taught that their ideas are important and that they have value. And so the, the idea behind places that tell stories about people is to allow people to, to tell you who they are and to try and find a way to express it in the architecture of that building. Most of my career has been involved in working very closely with, like I once tried to do a Rascuachismo project, right, for the University of Texas system and they thought I was crazy because I showed them pictures of buildings that were organic, that were, you know, houses of poor people and they go, we can't build a university that looks like that. And so years later I f went to the University of Texas Rio Grande and found that planetarium that they wanted to demolish it. said, so, don't demolish it, you need to keep it, you need to bring young people to it so that they understand that the education is their future, that they can be scientists. And so uh, every single community is different and I think the design process needs to respect the, 
the traditions, the viewpoint, the culture of those people, because as you know, you know, climate conditions are different, uh, cul cultural traditions are different, and I think that the, what unites us as Latinos is this incredible vibrancy of ideas, and allowing that to, to, to take place, to find its voice, I think is the most important thing. Thank you. Thanks. That was a great uh, talk, both of you. Thank you very much. So there's a planning question for, for both of you. So in New York and in cities, big cities in North America, we think in order to animate a street, you've got to have retail on both sides of the street uh, in, order to keep, in order to keep the streets animated. Almost every uh, city I've been to in South and Latin America have places like the Malacone, the Prado, the Rambla, where you don't have this you, you don't have this kind of retail animation, but you have this extraordinary social interaction that happens on these boulevards and these waterfronts. I know that you're the river project you had, I mean, that made me think about that a lot, but uh, do, you, do you ever have thoughts uh, when, when you're doing your planning studies of actually incorporating these sort of older ideas of these monumental kind of parades where people can actually interact? So it seems so common in South and Latin America to me. Um, I mean, for us, it's, it's thinking a little bit about kind of like guerrilla urbanism. Um, it's very difficult to plan something like La Ramblas, but we're always thinking about like, how can we place small detonators for that to happen? Uh, even if there's no planning permission for it, how can you set up a certain, uh, certain street level configuration in which people will actually take over the sidewalk even though it wouldn't be be permitted and we're always kind of trying to uh to push for that um it's amazing here in in, in a lot of neighborhoods in in brooklyn i was in in clinton hill on monday how people literally take over the the sidewalk and do barbecues there that's a really vital city and neighborhood and that's what we really need to to push so it's not about planning scale uh, or, or a city scale, it's about developers or architects really putting in small, really small objects and interventions that can make that happen. It's not that complicated. I'm, I'm not even sure, I'm not even sure where retail is going. Quite honestly, my husband is significantly younger than me and I, he never really, everything comes to our door nowadays, right? So I think to build urban planning practices based on the future of retail is probably not that smart. It, but you're right, here's where you are right. The, um, the great tradition of planners from Latin America and the Latino community of the United States is based on these places, right? These public places. Like one of the places I absolutely love that taught me so many lessons when I was first beginning this exploration is a theater called the Alameda, right? Which was in San Antonio, Texas, which was a theater that was built. It was an integrated theater that was built during the time of segregation. If your last name was Munoz in San Antonio back then, you had to sit in the colored balcony and this place said, no, we're gonna integrate. People are gonna sit side by side and the architectural tradition of the, of the theater was the, the architecture of the time art deco, but rendered through this incredible artistry of the Latino community, the Mexican-American uh, tradition of craft. And it's set on a street that literally was a tree-lined street, the tradition of Alamedas throughout uh, places like Texas and Mexico and Latin America. So I think the idea of places that are activated by culture, right? Resources, the, the zones, for example, what to me I love, I mean, obviously I love the, what they're calling the Latino High Line, right? The park that we've been building in San Antonio, but I'm just as interested in the way that the opportunity zones butt up to them. Do you have, edu do you have an opportunity to be able to walk to a university? Do you have access to healthcare, right? Is there a public school close by what what are the what are the what are the cultural needs that a community needs that it will always need in order to to access opportunity 
Um, hi, thank you very much for this conversation. It's it's enlightening and interesting. And um, Alfonso, you, you, you touched a nerve on me before when you were asked a question about affordable housing, and you made a distinction between affordable housing and housing that's affordable. And in the context of New York, this matters. And could you just expand more on that distinction? What is housing that's affordable versus affordable housing? I mean, for me, the understanding of affordable housing is a very political thing. Once you go into politics, it's fucked up. Uh, and you have the result of like a poor door, which is really like, it's insane that something like a poor door can happen. Uh, but again, that goes down to planners, tax abatements, and, and developers will always find a way to, to do that. So you're working within systems that are very, very established, and, and you have the bankers and the loans and the planners and code, and there's so, so many components that you have to, to go through. Um, so if you're thinking of them independently and you're only doing and focusing on one of them, your change will be very, very minor. Um, and that's why, why for us, we, you need to completely rethink all of them in order to do housing that's, that's affordable and that's our, our objective. I mean, we see housing as a tool because it's actually a, a right. It's literally everybody should have a, a decent place to to live, um, so there is that distinction. And, and for us, it's not a political thing. It's just about a right. Okay, I think we have um, come up to the end. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Alfonso. Thank you all for being here today.